No monarch in history has reigned longer, traveled further, or met so many of the world's people as the Queen. Turn around the other way because that's where the camera is. <laughs> For seven decades, the Queen has crisscrossed the globe by land, sea, and air. And then I flew home by Concorde, which was the only way I could get home in time to open Parliament in London. Bringing together what she calls her family of nations, the Commonwealth. And now, the Queen is passing the baton to the younger generations. I nice see you again. Nice to see you. How are you? Welcome. In this historic year, we've enjoyed privileged access to the Queen. It is unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> and all her family too. So nice to see it again. <laughs> this is my first time seeing wow. a veil like and this. And what did it feel like putting it on? <laughs> it's a pretty magical day. I bet it was. Yeah, it was very really special. special. We'll see them welcoming the world at home. Have you bumped into the Queen yet? Not yet. If you suddenly bump into her in the corridor, don't panic. I know you will. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> and flying the flag abroad. A lot of ladies wearing your creations. <laughs> yes. With access to the Queen's private home movies. <laughs> We've seen how she's inspired one generation. What do you say when you walk up to a complete stranger? <laughs> so you learn by experience. But <laughs> and encouraged the next. You made me blush. Stop. And we've captured the excitement as a new Commonwealth journey begins. 53 countries as well, my goodness. It, it'll keep us busy. This is the British royal family on the global stage. And the story of how our Queen has come to be seen by millions as Queen of the World. It's an historic year for the royal family. The Queen is to host a reunion of all 53 Commonwealth leaders at Buckingham Palace. It will be the largest gathering of its kind for a generation. National Congress of Gujarati. With many months to prepare for the Commonwealth Summit, Tonight, the Queen is holding a reception to celebrate the close ties between Britain and India. Okay. I'll be around about... That, that won't be before... Is it made? Yeah. 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 Downstairs in the royal kitchens, there's something special on the menu. The rest of the canapes are in the, in the box. Yes, sir. Bit narrows. Bit narrows now. Yeah. It's always the race against the time in the kitchen because you've got one eye on the clock. A lot of people come to Buckingham Palace once in their life. The last thing we want is every people going home saying, oh, it was amazing, I didn't think much of the canapes. We share the heritage that goes back many centuries, so I think, and obviously, a shared language. This is a great reaffirmation of our special ties. Tonight, these ties will extend to the food. Royal chef Mark Flanagan has teamed up with chefs from London's oldest Indian restaurant, Viraswami. It's the Queen's idea of curry night. And because we hang the yogurt for at least two to three days, and we allow the yogurt to become a little sour. So this top tip, great <laughs> yogurt. Yeah, yeah. okay. So we've got, we've got a beautiful English rhubarb creme brulee tartlet and then we've got the rajpuri here. Different spices coming through, tamarind, then mint and yogurt. I think your uh, tandoori prawn cocktail is a triumph yeah. and uh, we're hoping that that will be very yeah. popular this evening. People in India really respect her uh, and the charm, the grace uh, that she brings to her exalted office. 
I, I must confess I didn't eat too much because I'm putting on a lot of weight, but I did try and sample a few things. The cuisine is, is excellent. <laughs> the special relationship between Britain and India goes back to the beginning of the Commonwealth story. An era has ended, a new epoch begins. A subcontinent larger than the whole of Europe becomes two self-governing dominions within the British Commonwealth of Nations. Indian independence in 1947 brought the British Empire to a close. In place of the empire, the Queen's father, King George VI, created the Commonwealth, a free association of equal nations. At the British High Commissioner's residence in Delhi, they're preparing for the arrival of the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. Everybody's really calm until the day they arrive. <laughs> yes. So to speak, my staff has everything under control till I discover otherwise. <laughs> that's when I get my blood pressure going up. <laughs> We've got three bedrooms upstairs. This is the main room, the principal room, which we call the Prince's room. And this is the drawing room. And this is where all the networking and all the uh, business talks and everything takes place. So this is the equities room. Yeah, it's not com anything compared to five-star hotels. It is a very humble room. They are not the only ones preparing for the royal visit. At a school across the city, the children and teachers are planning a special welcome for the Prince of Wales. All that they know is that the Prince of a faraway country is visiting us. It's okay, you have to be the same. You don't have to be nervous. The Prince is coming to see you all because you all are the best. best. So you have to be the best. Okay? Don't think shy. He's a very nice man. Visiting India informally, Prince Charles arrives at Palam Airport. He is greeted by India's Vice President, Mr. B.D. Jaffe. Prince Charles first came to India at the age of 27. With him was his great uncle, Lord Mountbatten, who had been the last Viceroy of India before independence. The Republic's Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. People don't always understand about the concept of, of duty. It's a, it's a strange thing. I think a lot of the time you have to be brought up to understand what it actually means. Minding about other people, minding about you know, what happens in this country and, and the Commonwealth. And that's, that's the only way. And, you know, there are masses of people who need to be was encouraged and thanked. The prince is due at the school in an hour's time. We are cleaning our school to welcome him, and we are putting banners, and uh, we are doing flower decorations for him. It's been quite hectic. <laughs> we want everything to look good. But a call comes through with some unexpected news. OK. Delhi air quality is really poor right now, and the government has ordered a shutdown of schools. And so we had to cancel the prince's visit. The children were ready with their song, and they were prepared. But perhaps all is not lost. Back in London, diplomatic preparations are underway for a very different royal encounter. Good morning. Good morning, Your Majesty. I have the honor to respectfully present to you the letters of credence appointing me. It's a tradition 
that all new ambassadors, and if they're from the Commonwealth, High Commissioners, are presented to the Queen. But first, at St. James's Palace, they receive a lesson in royal etiquette from the Queen's Marshal of the Diplomatic Corps, Alistair Harrison. Welcome. Alistair Harrison, very nice to see you. Please, come on in. So, welcome to London. Today, it's the turn of the new Ugandan High Commissioner, Julius Moto. OK, I'll get the Queen. The job of standing in for the Queen goes to Alistair's assistant, Georgina. Good morning, Hacker. Uh, Georgina has kindly given us the coffee and tea and will now pretend to be the Queen. The audience takes place in the 1844 room, which is about the same size as this room. So it's just really putting the ambassadors at ease. It's nice for the ambassadors to be able to visualise there's someone standing there. When they open the doors to the Queen, you know, suddenly they're quite often taken aback. They all sort of hold the Queen in such high esteem. It's really lovely to see. Um, so lots of them say, I just think it's just like with Georgina in the rehearsal. Perfect. You need to stand, uh, if you stand a little bit to the right so that you can see the Queen. Quite often when I see some of them afterwards, they say, oh, it's Her Majesty. <laughs> it's a lovely way to be remembered. At the Ugandan High Commission, the big day has arrived. We're excited because our High Commissioner is getting his first welcome to meet the Queen of England. Today is a very important day for me. I'll be presenting my letters of credence to Her Majesty the Queen. He looks beautiful. I really like him. I'm very excited about the whole process. Very excited. Commonwealth ambassadors don't just get the title of High Commissioner. The Queen sends four horses to pull their carriage, instead of two. I'm trying to feed the royal horse. Ah, I'm feeding it the royal carriage. <laughs> At St. James's Palace, Alistair is preparing for a ceremony that's changed little over the centuries. So this is the sword, which I could draw if I needed to, but of course uh, I have no idea how to use the sword, so it, it wouldn't really be much point. And then this is the, the tunic, uh, which goes on over the sword. Um, I wear a sword because it was always the tradition that in the olden days ambassadors came for one of two reasons, either to declare war or to make peace. And my chain of office has a medallion on, which has two sides. One side has the olive branch, the symbol of peace, and that is the side that I will wear outwards today. But just in case, uh, it can be turned round with a sword. And if I was wearing the sword outwards, then Her Majesty the Queen would know that the, uh, the ambassador had come for a rather different reason. But today, the High Commissioner is most definitely coming in peace. The High Commissioner of the Republic of Uganda, Mrs. Eunice Abeja Moto, Your Majesty. The tradition is for the new diplomats to give the Queen a sealed letter containing their credentials. Your Majesty. Now the High Commissioner can begin his term of office. Eunice Abeja Moto. You've got your family here too, have you? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. They're all in school? Yes. Mm. It was nice, very nice, well executed. I had a very good presentation of my credentials. The Queen talked about her own visit to Uganda in 2007 to the High Commissioner, who uh, greatly appreciated that, so I think everything went very well indeed. Let's go. Oh, one, one, two. 4,000 miles away in Delhi, there's good news for the school children. The prince and his team have arranged a new venue where he can meet them. I don't think they really know where they're going. All they know is that they are going somewhere. Bye. The children have arrived at the British Council building in the centre of Delhi. 
This is a once in a lifetime experience. Some of them never leave their home or school and that's the world for them. So, you know, to go to a massive big building, this is game changing. They've never seen this before. So, very excited for them. I think they'll come back home, talk to their parents, uh, share their stories. If sir will give you permission, you can ask your questions now. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. what they are, really. Yes. <laughs> now, Earth may to choose. Anyone? What about? This one. Okay. Which is your favorite book? Book? Yes. That's a very good thing. <laughs> now, well, I tell you what, none of you have read, have you, any of the Harry Potter books? Mm. Not yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe when you do, they're very good books. When you become a king, you will build a fort. Will you build a fort? Like a king. The children have prepared a song, which the message uh, of the song is unity. We are all? We are all one. one. Yes. Very good. <laughs> so how do you say we are all one in Hindi? Hindi me kaise bolo? Hindi me kaise bolo? Ham sab ek hai. Ham sab ek hai. Zor se bolo ek saath. Ham sab ek hai. It's not loud enough. <laughs> I thought the children did marvelously well, and I'm so proud of them. I was simply bursting with pride. The Queen has appointed Prince Harry as her Commonwealth Youth Ambassador. Today, he's at Commonwealth HQ in London. 60% of the Commonwealth's 2.4 billion citizens are under 30. The newlywed Duke and Duchess of Sussex have already made a big impression. I recall that for their wedding gift, they wanted the money to go towards charities and donations. So from the onset, I see that they are interested in development and in people. I think that's great. I think that's really inspiring. And there was another Commonwealth message at the heart of their wedding day. It was important for me, especially now being a part of the royal family, to have all 53 of the Commonwealth countries incorporated. And I knew that it would be a fun surprise as well for my now husband, who didn't know. Yeah. So there's Canada. Yeah. The bunch berries from Canada, the Australian wattle and then a Papua New Guinea orchid. Today, Prince Harry is assisting in one of the Queen's Commonwealth programs. Olympian Samo Farah is there too. He's, he's retiring at the end of this year. I think he's not for a long way. Do you know how much you know how far you've run in total? I've probably gone to Africa back. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the Queen's Young Leaders Awards. The Queen's Young Leaders Programme was launched in 2014, and we now have Queen's Young Leaders represented from every country in the Commonwealth. It's the Queen's way of recognising the work of young people who are making a difference in their home countries. It means so much to them. You can see in their face when they went up to the Queen, bow and went up to them. You can see the face, the light, the joy, and so many of them. And they're so young too. And they all done it through hard work and dedication. And um, I'm sure it's just inspired them even more to do more and, and make it better. One of the recipients is Elizabeth Kite, a champion of women and young people's rights in Tonga. I'm getting ready to meet the Queen. This explains why I'm wearing this. This is actually called a gear in Tongan, and it's passed down from generation to generation. Yeah, so this is almost 100 years old. This is my mum's, it's still my mum, she hasn't passed it down yet. 
The Queen visited Tonga in 1953, during her Great Commonwealth Tour, shortly after the coronation. The visit is still remembered fondly, and many years later, Elizabeth's mother would name her own daughter after the Queen. Growing up as a little girl, you've always known of Queen Elizabeth. You know, my name comes from her. Um, you do never think of... You never think that you'd actually meet her one day, and that day is actually happening for me today. So I hope I look good <laughs> for her. I'm just... Right now, extremely nervous, I'll be really honest. I woke up this morning and hadn't registered yet. Um, as the day went by, kind of set in. Okay, so I think that's secure. And yeah, now, you know, I've got my outfit on, ready to actually meet her. Um, yeah, I'm getting a little nervous. Here we go. Okay, I think I'm ready. It all feels very dreamlike. I think I'm going to, once I'm back home, wake up and just kind of realize what on earth just happened. Was there ever such a feast as this in the Friendly Isles? Certainly, Queen Salote meant it as a unique event, the fame of which would spread round the world. Here were all the riches of the Pacific and the Coral Isles. Here was happiness and goodwill in abundance as the two queens sat there side by side. That's just the Tongan way. We don't have much, we're very poor, but we come together and we give all that we can when we can. This was a very important time for the Queen as well as ourselves, so it's just so nice to see that how well we came together. But before Elizabeth heads home, there's a last minute surprise. Elizabeth? Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Um, <laughs> I've got some news, okay. uh, some very exciting news. You and two of your fellow Queen's Young Leaders yeah. are gonna have a private audience oh my with Her Majesty the Queen in Buckingham Palace. Are you serious? Quite serious. Oh my God. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> no. no. no that wow. Really... Connection's so bad. Elizabeth calls her sister. I'll just tell you because the connection is so poor, but I've been selected to go meet with Her Majesty tomorrow or two or the Queen's Young Leaders. So it's just us three that actually get to like have like a chat in person. Isn't that cool? I know. I don't know why I'm crying. I keep crying. <laughs> <laughs> It's another busy day at Buckingham Palace. The Governor General of Papua New Guinea has flown 9,000 miles to be knighted by the Queen. His Excellency, Governor General of Papua New Guinea, and Lady Lama, Very nice to see you. Because that's where the camera oh, is. <laughs> it is. It is indeed a, a privilege for me. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that. Yes. Very nice. I hope you're quite happy too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't take, take a yes. seat. Yes. It is a dream for many people who commit their life to, to serve people. Uh, only very few get recognition. Yes. And I happen to be one of those very few from Papua New Guinea. Can you open it? Yes, of course. No, no, this, this door. Push it, push it open. That's right. Thank you. Otherwise they can't get in. Yes. I'm extremely nervous. I'm shaking just a little bit, but uh, I just need to try and stay composed. Miss Elizabeth Kitten, nice. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Miss Edward Addison. Mr. Habat Hussain. 
see, I was still, I was still um, not too exhausted by all the things that we've been doing. So exciting. It's very busy, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> it's a long day. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, it sounds as though you've got a very busy programme. It's been very busy, but all very exciting, so we, yeah. How, how, long, how much longer have we got? I leave tonight. Oh, we finished, yeah. We I think we all finished tonight. I, I live yeah. in London, so. She's like, I'm in London, so. Are you? Very nice. Well, take a seat. Thank you. So you go back tonight, do you? I do. I leave tonight. I did leave Tonga permanently for three years, which is where I started doing my works that I got recognised for with the programme. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, the, the programme is an, an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, all the subjects you, you do, all the, all the people I saw yesterday, I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Tonga, I'm afraid I haven't been to it for a very long time. I know. But you have got... I've been twice. It's been well documented. <laughs> I've actually watched the documentary. Have you? Absolutely, yeah. And you met um, Queen Solomon last year. I met Queen Solomon, yes. Did you enjoy your time there? Did oh, yes. It was wonderful. Yeah. We had the, the people playing the nose flutes outside yes. the window. Yes, that's true. It's an extraordinary thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awfully uncomfortable, but they, they play rather well. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I found difficult was sitting cross legged. For a long period of time, it can be difficult. <laughs> it's quite painful. But yeah. people who are not built in the same direction, I don't know. Yeah. I've met both your, the kings. Yeah. And uh, I haven't met the new one. So that's... But you see, I've had been such a long time. Yeah. I've met an awful lot of people. <laughs> 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 I just had a chance to just take a I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be like, did yeah. that happen? I don't quite know. <laughs> Honestly, anything really is possible. Whatever it is that you dream to be, you can actually achieve. What most Commonwealth countries share is a legacy as part of the British Empire. No country played a bigger role in Britain's imperial story than India. When the Queen arrived there in 1961, India had been independent for nearly 14 years. No one quite knew how the Queen would be received. It must have seemed a paradox that the Republic of India, no longer owing allegiance to the Crown, should yet so wholeheartedly welcome the sovereign. Almost two million people turned out to greet her in Delhi alone. It was a sign that India and Britain could have a future together as equals within the Commonwealth. There have been more than a dozen royal tours to India since then. In 2016, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge made their first visit. For Prince Charles, this is his ninth trip. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are hosting a party at the High Commissioner's residence. It's an event to raise awareness of India's endangered wild elephants. I love your turquoise elephant. Thank you so much. This is so painted. No, it's actually stickers. How long? Three months. Three months? <laughs> Three months? I'm not surprised. must have had very tired eyes. Very tired eyes. <laughs> the event has brought together a group of Indian celebrities who have each created an elaborately decorated elephant. Among them is one of India's most famous fashion designers, Sunit Varma. A lot of ladies wearing your creation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a great thing. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> Are all the ladies wearing your clothes? I'm like, yeah, some are not paying. <laughs> I have a huge amount of respect for the relationship and the love that he's shown our country. The idea of the Commonwealth is obviously to do good. And when two countries come together to do good, there can't be anything more positive than that. 
India's 1.2 billion citizens make up half of the entire Commonwealth's population. But it's been nearly 10 years since an Indian Prime Minister has attended a Commonwealth summit. With the historic reunion soon to happen in London, the Queen has asked Prince Charles to pass on a personal invitation to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Before leaving India, the Prince and the Duchess have a final engagement. They lay a wreath at India Gate, the memorial to Indian troops who died in the First World War. On every Commonwealth tour, the royal visitors pay tribute to those who gave their lives. It's the centenary of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the organization which maintains war graves and memorials all over the world. Watch out, watch out, watch out. You keep it on the ground. Keep it on the ground. To mark the occasion, they have been invited to take part in the Chelsea Flower Show. The right, the right, stop! Get over! You're in, you're in, you're in, you're in. The largest Commonwealth War Cemetery in Britain is at Brookwood in Surrey. This recently discovered colour film shows the Queen unveiling the Brookwood Memorial in 1958. Here, in this peaceful garden, the memory of these men and women, differing in race and religion, but united in the cause for which they fought and died, will be kept evergreen. Her words still have meaning for David Richardson, head gardener for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. These are people who don't have actual graves. There's a real resonance of what she said then in 1958 and what we do every day. We're remembering those individuals. It's really important that we commemorate them and remember those soldiers from all over the Commonwealth that fought and died for our freedom. It's so peaceful. It, it's a very emotional thing to wander around, given that, that beauty and that peace, and see all of these different graves. You then get a sense of the breadth of the Commonwealth, because there's soldiers from all different parts of the Commonwealth that were fighting in so many different campaigns. The Australians and New Zealanders and Canadians have come over. You know, you still find families, which is much easier to do now, is to identify where those their relations might be. And they can go and they can look and they can see just how much care is taken of their memories and their resting places. We often try and put in planting that somehow reflects the, the burials in the cemetery. So we've got this, you know, Canadian plot, but we've got the petals on these tulips, which are in the shape of a maple leaf. The maple leaf from one of the trees here in the cemetery. At Chelsea, the centenary garden is complete. Yeah, because the sites are sort of different, you know. The commission's vice chairman, Sir Timothy Lawrence, greets members of the royal family. And the bricks are from the Somme uh, uh, um, restoration of the Tietval Memorial. And look at the bees. David Dominic. Hello, very nice to meet you. David Richardson, Director of Horticulture for the War Graves Commission. Each little leaf, there's 154 of them, and they represent, each one represents a country with a war grave, uh, war grave site. Oh, that's really lovely. So you're sort of personalised. Yeah. Personalized. yeah. So 154 countries, 850 partners. Yeah. Biggest gardening organisation in the world. Yeah. Garden to Hello. 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 Nice to see you. Hello. Good to see you. Hello. 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 It, it's really delightful that they take time. It's a really busy, busy schedule. They're here for an hour, and they actually specifically requested to come and have a look at our garden. So it, it's really lovely. It's really lovely, and 
it's just, it's sort of the end of a perfect day for us. For garden designer David Dominey, this day has a special significance. My grandfather fought in the First World War, was blown up in the, in the trenches, so there, there was that, that connection. I think, for me, the importance of the garden is about the remembrance and the impact on your own lives when you visit a, a war grave site. Um, it is this emotional connection of the enormity, what would happen, and whatever's happening in your life pales into, into comparison to what happened to these young uh, men and women. Tobago. Buckingham Palace is getting ready for the Queen's Commonwealth Summit. Prime Minister of New Zealand. It's the first time in more than 40 years that all the Commonwealth heads have gathered in London. This is hugely special. Being a uh, a retired admiral, I'd say this is all hands on deck. This is a full ship's company effort. We've got the, the most beautiful gilt up from the, from the vaults, and uh, you'll see the most wonderful display with, with 12 tables, 130 people sitting down, 53 heads of nation and their spouses. As the household prepare for the banquet, the centerpiece of the opening ceremony arrives at the gates. The Commonwealth like the monarchy, has its own crown jewels. The most important, made of 18 karat gold and rubies, is the mace. The last time it was used in the UK was in Edinburgh in 92. Well, the Queen's got quite a large collection of silver and gilt. This just forms part of it. The Commonwealth mace is being transported to the state ballroom, where it will sit before the Queen at the opening ceremony. Does the, the big end go that way oh, or that way? Um, I can ask some of the lot champions off. I'd have to go onto Google and just look for a quick reference image. The state ballroom will be filled with world leaders and royalty, and every moment needs to be thoroughly rehearsed. And all I want you to do is say, um, I'm standing in for the Prince of Wales, yeah. and I will be speaking for approximately two and a half minutes. Yeah. OK, give it a pause and then say thank you, you can return to your seat. Yeah. And the torture is over. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, is that OK? Sure that's fine, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister of Singapore. Prime Minister of Canada. So it's a great pleasure and a huge honour to be able to do that announcing. And I hope it didn't sound a bit too much like a game show host. Prime Minister of Swaziland. As the final checks are made, there's an early arrival to see the Queen. The Prime Minister of India, Your Majesty. Her personal invitation to Prime Minister Modi has been accepted. Oh, very nice to see you again. Great to see you again. Mm. Very nice. Can you come, come to this great meeting? Yes, it's a great opportunity. Mm. And I will show you a letter. Good. <laughs> Your personal letter. Well, I'm very glad. <laughs> <laughs> so, Last time I could not, but this time I made a point. Oh, that's very kind. Yeah. Would you like to come and take a seat? Please. Well, it's going to be quite a gathering. It's not just heads of government who have gathered in London. Hundreds of young people from around the Commonwealth have come along too. Prince William is here to welcome them. You'll make me blush. Stop. There's too many men screaming. Your, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here at the QE2 Centre at the start of this very historic Commonwealth Week in London and in Windsor. During the course of this week, across all the different events, you'll be seeing a lot of the royal family. The Commonwealth leaders begin to arrive at Buckingham Palace. 
the Queen has invited the heads of government into her own home. It's exciting for them, I think. They're really enjoying it, judging by the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's great. We're all friends now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most exciting day you can imagine. It is an extraordinary day to be here and to feel the connection. You know, there is a sense of family. Uh, to have that common ground, despite our many different circumstances, is something special. It was that very chatty, informal, relaxed atmosphere, and that really set the tone. <laughs> there are a few new faces for the Queen, though most are very familiar. I think it was really poignant to think that she first met Justin Trudeau when he was a babe in arms. Quite a thing to be able to see a leader in that perspective. Her Majesty has done an extraordinary job of uh, pulling us together with challenges from time to time, but that's, uh, that's what a family's all about. Today, the Queen has her family to help shake hands with the world. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall greet New Zealand's Prime Minister. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Kits and Nevis is meeting the Princess Royal. Oh, no, I'm not Good morning. Very nice to see you. While Prince Andrew is due to greet the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Your Highness. Yeah. Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how are you? Very nice to meet you. Good, good. good. Come on in. Minister. Minister, how are you? How are you? Very nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. How are you? Welcome. Very well, thank you. Yeah? Prince William is here doing his bit, and Prince Harry is turned up too. And there's even a mention of the next generation, yet to be born. Uh -huh. Awaiting the imminent arrival of number three. <laughs> so congratulations in advance to that. That's right. As long as it doesn't come in the next 20 minutes, we'll, okay. <laughs> we'll manage. <laughs> In 1949, at the invitation of George VI, eight nations gathered in Buckingham Palace to agree the London Declaration. The modern Commonwealth was born, with the king at its head. But the role is not hereditary. The queen was chosen by the member states. Now, almost 70 years later, with the family of 53 nations once again gathered at the palace, the Queen is looking to the future. It is my sincere wish that the Commonwealth will continue to offer stability and continuity for future generations. And will decide that one day, the Prince of Wales should carry on the important work started by my father in 1949. The important thing to recognize is any decision about who should or could be made head of the Commonwealth is made by the 53 heads themselves. And they may take into consideration any factor that they deem appropriate. Just 24 hours later, the 53 nations make their decision. It was very clear that people wanted um, the Prince of Wales to, uh, to be the next head of the Commonwealth. And uh, I, that was tremendous feeling. And once again, a feeling of coming together, the family of the Commonwealth, but also of continuity. There are generations in the Commonwealth who've never known anybody else as their kind of head of state. That's quite a remarkable um, position to be in. One of the most important aspects of this second Elizabethan age, which we have witnessed, has been the transformation of the British Commonwealth, largely due to the stewardship, guidance, and leadership of Queen Elizabeth II. She has been the rock 
that has kept this organization steady and true to its positive beliefs and in its capacity to be a force for good in our world. Everybody wanted to say thank you. They really felt the enormity of her sacrifice and her commitment and her faithfulness. And they also wanted to say to her, the baton will go on and we won't let you down. <laughs>